Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, fallout continues over long voting lines at last month's presidential preference election, and a governor signs a bill that loosens control over anonymous campaign donations. The Journalist Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Mary Jo Pitzel of the Arizona Republic, Howard Fisher of Capital Media Services, and Mike Sonics of the Phoenix Business Journal. A legislative hearing this week did nothing to ease frustration and accusations over last month's troubled presidential preference election. If anything, Mary Jo, it, uh, it may have made matters worse, huh? Yeah, this was a hearing that House Elections Committee Chairwoman Michelle Eugenti called, Eugenti Rita called, like, two days after the whole um, election fiasco. So people had all weekend to sort of get worked up about this, to get organized to the extent that they were organized. It didn't seem very organized to me. Um, and they, they filled hearing rooms at the Capitol. And what added to the frustration is that not everybody got to speak. I mean, it went on for three hours and the lawmakers said, we're gonna have to cut this off. We got we gotta go to caucus. You know, the crowd doesn't know what the heck that means. We gotta go to floor, we'll ask for a postponement. You know, they went back and forth. So, uh, you know, after I'd say about, I think the estimate was about 20% of the people who had signed mm -hmm. in to speak got to have a say. Um, they adjourned the meeting and the angry people went upstairs because the legislature was going to get ready to um, debate the dark money bill, which we'll get to later on. And they went upstairs and some of them were escorted uh, out of upstairs, correct? I mean, it was... Exactly. I mean, they decided they were going to do, for lack of a better word, it was like 1968 Chicago, you know, the whole world is watching and protest. And one guy ended up having to get arrested because he wasn't going so, so quickly. And uh, uh, it, it, was, it was fascinating because you have to remember, they waited in line for some of these people four or five hours to vote. Then they're told you have to wait to talk about yeah. you having to wait in line to vote. Yes. Some people drove down here and, uh, you know, the frustration builds. And this is the kind of thing that lawmakers should have anticipated, maybe held an evening meeting. I know they don't want to disturb their drinking time, but, but seriously, <laughs> uh, you know, hold an evening meeting, you know, make, give everybody a couple of minutes. It was also and, and in a small venue. And, and frankly, the folks that showed up were probably a lot of them were Bernie Sanders voters. And they're, they're dealing in a Republican county with a Republican recorder and a Republican legislature, and they go down there. And as we know, sometimes the, our lawmakers down there aren't always as cordial as they could be to the public sometimes. And so I think there was a lot of frustrations because they're seeing their candidate. They saw big crowds for Bernie while he was here, put a lot of effort in here, and he's done well in some other western states, and he got blown out here. And he got beat really bad in early votes. And so they're looking at that and saying, well, maybe our, our folks turn out at the polls a little more, and all this stuff conspired against well, them. Well, the conspiracy theory were running uh, hot and heavy here. We had Representative uh, Eugenti read it on the program, and it doesn't sound like anything was learned from the hearing. Was anything learned? Um, well, I talked to a couple of the legislators who were at the hearing about what they learned, and Eugenti Rita said, well, you know, I, uh, she's still confused about how they got to 60 or just 60 yes. polling places. Um, she pointed out that there is a provision in the law right now that says if you're going to hold a presidential preference election, you must have at least no more than half as many polling places as is per normal. She doesn't understand why that was written into the law and wanted to uh, understand the origins of it and probably get rid of it. Um, you know, the rest of it, I mean, other lawmakers said, well, we really wanted to understand the whole registration problem, which is what I think brought a lot of, especially the Sanders supporters out. And they didn't even get into that. Well, and do, that, do we even, I mean, I still can't get a good answer. And we've had a ton of people mm -hmm. on this program who decided, we know who decided there would be 60, but who decided where this 60 would be? Because we've got the mayor of Phoenix saying that it seems like the, the, his city was underrepresented. We've got folks saying the low income and, and Latino areas were under, I mean, but, all sorts of accusations. Who decided where these things were gonna be? Well, it kind of came down to where could we rent a hall? Where could we find a place? Uh, some of it was based on where they had done before. And I think a lot of it was, was somewhat scattershot. Uh, I mean, you had three polling places in Gila Bend. Now, one of the arguments was, well, we didn't do it when people lived, we did it where they worked. I'm sorry, not a lot of folks are working over in Gila Bend, but somehow that's the yes. way it, it ended up. Well, I think especially the Gila Bend thing sort of been blown out of proportion because two of those 
polling places were, I think, technically on Indian reservations. Mm -hmm. There's a different set of rules under federal law mm -hmm. when it comes to the Indian reservations. Anybody, if they were going to do 180 polls or 724, would have had to had had those. Sorry, it's just well, the way. Well, you even had places where people couldn't park. I mean, that was a huge issue mm -hmm. too, especially yeah. in Central Phoenix and stuff. And but I think the folks, the Sander folks, the, the Democrats, they look at the the big narrative on 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 voting in this country and in politics and in this state, and they see Republicans as suppressing the vote. That's their kind of what they view. Motor voter, go back to that voter registration, all these supposed voter fraud uh, bills that you see Republicans run in states like Arizona. And then they go down to a hearing and they don't get a lot of answers about anything. And the media is not getting a lot of answers. And it kind of builds but, upon that. And so their frustrations aren't going away. But I'm less inclined to believe a conspiracy theory on this. I mean, for example, uh, Heather Carter, who lives in Scottsdale, pointed to a large area in her district, said, no polling places near here. Now, there aren't a lot of Democrats living in North Scottsdale. You know, they're kind of an endangered species there. So I think this was a combination of, well, what can we put together? And how do we save money? And that's really the yes. key to this. Yeah, this is all let's about money. Get into that because we had the chairman of the Board of Supervisors on. And his instructions to the election folks, to Helen Purcell, uh, be, as, be frugal. as frugal as possible. Exactly. Because what happened was, um, the in the prior election, presidential preference, you know, they, they had a dollar twenty-five per voter, and then they voted subsequently say, we'll cover your full costs. And then immediately, basically rescinded that as part of a budget cutting move. So they were back to the buck twenty-five, which they say does not cover their costs. So they told Helen, and they told the, the, you know, Karen Osborne, who's the elections director, okay, how can we do this without busting the budget? There's a bill in the legislature to repay them, which is still stalled and is also tied to the idea of getting rid of the presidential preference primary. And so they said, okay, how do we do this on the cheap? But working against that is that this cut, you know, didn't happen just to Maricopa County. Mm -hmm. The, you know, the, the reduction in election funding from the state went to all the other counties. So you call a couple of them and say, well, how, how'd you do it? You know, I mean, Tucson had 124 polling locations, or Pima County, a much smaller place than Maricopa County. And they just found a way to make it work. I think that the dynamic, especially in Maricopa County, is that this comes on, yes, they sucked it up and they find the money in other parts of their budget, but there have been years of the state taking money either from the mm. counties or shifting state responsibilities onto yeah. the counties. And, that's, and that makes them all very hesitant and, and, that and they'll- And that's the key. Yeah. And you, you, you put your finger exactly on it. They are ticked off because every time the state needs money, they say, Oh, you know the part about the who, who pays for locking up juveniles? That's yours. Right. You right. know the part about uh, treating the mental health? That's yours. And so I think the supervisor in this county, and remember, these are Republican supervisors, Republican legislature finally said, uh-uh. That's not only yours, but you get no say in the policy involved. Exactly. Just, just, just do the job. I, I don't think the folks, there's folks think there's a conspiracy theory, but I think a lot of folks just think Republicans don't like big voter turnout, so they're a little ob obtuse but, but, but to stop, some of the concerns. Stop right there, because this is a presidential preference election. Republicans voted for Republicans, Democrats voted for Democrats. Who? Who wins they don't care. They don't care. The, the, the folks on the left think that Republicans in general don't have a big voting interest in big turnout in general. They, they don't care about that. They like smaller turnout. And, and so that, that's kind of their backdrop for everything, even in a primary, because they think that he, Bernie Sanders will say at all his rallies, the more turnout we get, the better Democrats I, 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 do, the better we do. I, I, and so they view that. I'm, that's their mindset. No, on I'm, stuff, see, I'm, I'm going to disagree with you on that because of the fact that one of the arguments has been that school boards and cities purposely schedule certain things in bond elections Prop one, two, to, three. to get a low turnout, knowing that the committed will turn out, mm -hmm. and that the Republicans have been arguing for consolidated elections, particularly to get a high turnout. So I, I, I'm I not would disagree with that. I would, I would say if you look if you look at primary elections, folks farther on the extremes, including the right, tend to do better because there's lower turnout. So you have moderates that make the same the same type type of argument. I, but the one thing you say, the conservatives are always about what's the basic rule things roles of government? Is it holding democratic elections? part of that. It doesn't really feel like that. And we're not the only state that's kind of gone through this. Right. And I think to support what Mike's mm -hmm. saying is that the Democrats on that panel uh, Monday were trying to use that as a podium to say, look, look at these laws that have been coming out of the legislature, the Republican controlled legislature that, you know, we believe suppress the vote. You know, we've got the mm -hmm. ballot collection measure that's going to become law, you know, later this summer. So I think there is, the, we haven't proven that there was an intent to suppress the vote, but that's what happened. Right. It's what happened. Again, I just can't 
quite figure out who that would benefit if only Republicans vote for Republicans you, and only you, Democrats you, you, vote you, for you're, Democrats. You're, you're assuming that this is that there was actual thought behind this as opposed to incompetence. I hate to say that's what it was, but that's what it comes down to. All right, real quickly, uh, we do have a vote on Prop, what did you call it, one, two, three? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Prop 123 is going to have mm -hmm. a vote here in May. Uh, are these going to be fixed? Helen Purcell says, you bet you they're going to yeah. be fixed. Are they going to be fixed? Oh, yeah. They have promised to try to have twice as many polling places. Now, what's going to be fascinating is the turnout may end up being 17%, and you'll be able to roll a bowling ball down some of the, some of these polling places here, uh, unless the electorate gets gets really wired up. And but they, she's not going to risk this but, again. Oh yeah, but who, who's backing this? Who's backing this thing? Oh, the governor, the chambers, yes, all the powers there, that be, therefore, all those people. Not not those little Bernie Sanders voters. It's going to be all the powers that be, and they'll they'll do it right. And Howie's absolutely right. They'll have 17, 15 percent turnout. Right. All right. Uh, and and they are looking for more polling places. They released a letter today. The county school superintendents got a list of like 37 school districts that said, yeah, we'll host a polling place yeah. in May. Now, of course, this might be in the school's interest, too, because Prop 123 yeah. would every, provide every money Every chamber of schools. commerce will be open, every Cold Stone creamery But, but I think, open. you know, Howie's prediction, I think a lot of people in the press corps, a lot of people at the Capitol saying, yeah, we're going to have this proliferation of polls for May 17th, <laughs> and people aren't going to show up. If you remember, six years ago, Jan Brewer had a special election penny sales tax mm -hmm. increase for three years for the schools, very similar dynamics. The statewide turnout was 35%. You know, so it's a lower turnout. Yeah. Um, and they can blame the voters again. All right. Um, <laughs> let's move on here. Uh, the governor has signed what many describe as a dark money bill. Mm -hmm. uh, I initially said that it kind of loosens restrictions on anonymous spending. Let's face it, it gets rid of just about all uh, restrictions. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. Uh, if, if They basically created a roadmap that if you want to put anonymous money into campaigns, there's a lot of ways to do it. We start off with the basic stuff. Form a 501c4, a social welfare organization with the IRS, and the state says, oh, hey, the IRS hasn't challenged you, therefore, we're not going to ask you to report your donors. Uh, you've got the, one of the bigger loopholes that people don't see is this fundraising. Let's say Mike's running for office, and I want to help him get elected. I appreciate I can that. Put it, I can put up a $200,000 party so that he can hold a thousand dollar plate fundraiser and all the money goes to him. Now he knows who put up the two hundred thousand dollars, but the public never will. You've got other issues, all the criminal penalties gone. Mm -hmm. Now they're supposedly coming back if you believe Eric Spencer. Uh, you have issues of candidates giving from one to another, so you're sort of laundering money through whoever the first candidate is. And that's, they're, they're all quite curious, but the yeah. idea especially of, of transferring money from one to another, that sounds like unlimited donations by whomever wants to make them. Well, when you layer on another um, provision, which I'll get to in a second, but this this would this reverses a 1986 voter initiative that mm -hmm. said we don't want, you know, they called it the kingmaker provision, and I think it's from back in the day when Burton Barr was Speaker of the Arizona House. He was very influential. He had a big pot of money, and he could direct money to lawmakers and keep them in his corner and get them to go along with his agenda because he could give them get them a lot of money. Now the argument against you know, why are we so upset about this? Because, well, shoot, you know, a, a PAC can give, a candidate's PAC can give money to a candidate, but that's a, that's like one step removed. There's, there's another step in there. But the interesting thing is, that the one I love, is the provision that they call reattribution. So <laughs> it takes a while to figure out what that means. But, so I want to help Howie get elected, and I really think he's a great candidate. I give him way too much money over the spending amount, the, right. the, the contribution limit. Howie could give me the excess back, which is what the law is now, or how he could say, I'm just going to reassign this money and say it came from, from my mom, and it came from the guy down the street, and it came from Burton Barr, um, and that would be perfectly legal. Now, the author of the bill, um, State Elections Director Eric Spencer, has said, well, the intent is that this would be from people who share the same checkbook, but there's nothing. There's nothing, there's nothing in the law that and, says and, that. And, and all this stuff about, well, the, strictly, you know, this is the funny part. Mary Jo and I went to an early hearing on this last year. And this was sold as, we're just taking the, the code and simplifying it. Cleaning it up. Cleaning it up. Well, we've cleaned out everything. They've, 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 they've it's executed gone. it. It's been yeah. terminated. Uh, they, uh, we had all this good government stuff. Yeah. Clean elections, all the Jim Peterson stuff. They've dismantled, they've, you know, dismantled most of it via, via legislation, via, via court challenges. And, you know, uh, 
the, the thing about this is a friend of the lobbyists because they like to entertain and you have a lot of lawmakers down there that don't make a lot of money and this is a way to kind of recoup that. Obviously people point to the governor's ties to to some dark money groups uh, you know, that went through his, his election campaigns and people see this as, as a direct benefit to candidates like him. So does this renter render contribution limits meaningless? Well, certainly from a 501c4, because from a, from a political yes. nonprofit corporation, there are limits for um, individual donors and for PACs. Th those remain. Um, and so as we reattribute them. <laughs> right. And then, that's, that's okay. The so, yeah, maybe. And another thing. <laughs> um, since when does a legislature think that the feds have their act together enough <laughs> to be the, the enforcers here. The feds have the IRS has admitted they're not going in and, and doing it. And so theoretically, a year and a half after the, 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 the organization is formed, let's say slightly before, before the November 16 election, year and a half, you'll get a Form 990, which will show some of how they've spent it. And then you can go in and say, well, wait, they, they spent more than 50% on political purposes and all that stuff. And this is all meant to hide it. Now, understand the philosophy behind this. The people who are pushing this, aside from the fact they'd like to influence government and do it quietly, say it promotes people to participate. People are scared that there'll be retribution, that if they find, somebody finds out you gave money to so-and-so or that you, you spent a million dollars on so-and-so, that somehow there'll be retribution there and this will promote people participating. You know, to which Steve Farley said, yeah, we got to protect those anonymous millionaires because Lord knows, you know, if you find out the Koch brothers participate, maybe you, you won't buy products from their companies. Well, well you know, the, the IRS enforcement's been neutered because of all the lowest learner stuff and, and the stuff that went on with them, with them targeting, you know, conservative groups. And so they're, they're hands off right now with a lot of groups. And the, the, the thing that Howie said that, that's the most salient is the fact that the, the lawmakers, the candidates know where they're getting the money from, know who's, who's buying the Cristal for them. Mm -hmm. We don't know who's buying that for them. Right. And so that's, that's the big problem for, for kind of the de democratic process. This is such a wide-ranging bill, Senate Bill 1516, um, that it's really hard to encapsulate everything mm -hmm. that's in there. There are some of the measures that um, we're told there are going to be fixed in a bill <laughs> um, over in the Senate, like the reattribution and the kingmaker, the transfers directly between candidates. Um, but we'll see. And you know, but that was sold to some of some reluctant Republicans who didn't like this. But they went along with it, saying, "Well, we think it's going to get fixed over in the Senate." But that assumes it yeah. will get fixed in the Senate. Yeah. It assumes that the governor would sign yes. it. So this is uh, this is this is an outgrowth of Citizens United. But if you look at the presidential campaign, what what candidates are talking about? Cruz, Trump, Sanders. This is all what they're talking about: cartels, crony capitalism, an unfair system. And here it is, kind of showing up right in our face, right here. All right, the governor signed uh, that particular bill uh, uh, yesterday. Also yesterday, an abortion uh, bill. Abortion bills, but the one that really is getting a lot of attention involves abortion-inducing drugs. And again, what looks to be the state basically saying, obsolete guidelines by the FDA, okay by us. Well, the backstory on this is there's this drug called RU486. It's got a medical name, and I will probably mispronounce it, so I will do it. Um, since 2000, the FDA has said the label says use it through seven weeks at 600 milligrams, but the FDA has never prohibited off-label use. And the doctors have found, you know, this works up to nine weeks and at 200 milligrams. And the doctors were using it that way. So in 2012, the legislature passed a bill saying, you will use it according to the FDA labels. Judge said, you can't just make it variable like that. So they came back this year and passed a bill said, you'll use it according to the FDA label at the end of last year. Well, guess what happened on Wednesday? The Literally FDA, a day before. I mean, this was, yes. this was amazing. The yeah. FDA comes back and says, you know, we've seen the research. You can use it through 10 weeks of pregnancy at the 200 milligram dose. Yet the governor's got a bill on his desk saying it's got to be the, set, the old standard, and the governor signs it anyway. Why so effectively, you know, the governor signed into law a bill that is made moot by the FDA ruling. Why did he do that? Because this was a key initiative of the Center for Arizona Policy, well, you know, that's been pushing this. And I'll, I'm going to go a step beyond that because he's not just made moot. He may not even want to change it because I talked to Kathy Herod today, who's Center for Arizona Center for Policy. Policy. Uh, talk about kingmaker provisions and all that stuff. Uh, Kathy Harrod said, it basically over her cold dead body, that they will go with a 10-week proposal. So she does not want 
the legislature to put in, after years of saying FDA standards are safe, now says FDA standards are political, and her, she, 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 now <laughs> she wants to say, no, we don't like the FDA. I thought her major concern was the health of the woman. Mm -hmm. And she is arguing that, that there are complications at nine and 10 weeks Never mind what the FDA says. So the says. FDA doesn't know what it's talking so about. So exactly. is this just setting us up for another lawsuit oh, over the an law abortion bill? The lawsuit mm -hmm. is coming. I mean, first of all, you already have an existing Ninth Circuit case that said any state medical standard that interferes with the rights of women that doesn't protect their health is illegal, yeah. per se. I, I think what's flummoxed some people is why the governor would sign this when he had an easy out. I mean... Uh, the FDA standard changed and, you know, yes, his heart and, you know, his mind is with that, the legislation that came to his desk, but it's not effective. There's, there's a lockstepness so, to, to the legislature and, and, and folks in the Republican Party here when it comes to, to abortion rights. I mean, this is really one of those Gilda Radner, never mind moments, right? Um, <laughs> timing is everything in life. And when they change the, 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 the rules, the guidelines, right, right before you have this bill, it is but, time but, to maybe let's move on. But one under, lawmaker said this was a perfect opportunity for the governor to show that he is not beholden to Kathy Herod. But, he is, but he is very anti-abortion. If Look, I think in Doug Ducey's heart, if he could, he would outlaw abortions. That's how he believes. Anything that makes medication abortions harder means past a certain point you need a surgical abortion. More expensive, more complicated, actually more dangerous for women, but to the extent that it throws up yet another the, the, How is absolutely right. There, there's not a lot of gray area. I mean, we're seeing this in the presidential race with, with Trump and everything. There's not a lot of gray area for, for a pro-life or a pro-choice elected official politician to, to move away from that. Even if there's a common sense thing and timing, it couldn't be any worse with this bill. They, they have no wiggle room. Well, I, the governor's not on the ballot, you know, for another two and a half years. And this, if this is headed to litigation, we've got another cost to the state, you know, and <laughs> we, you know, we have a lot of, you know, you go talk to any lawmaker and they'll give you a list of other needs that maybe but some of that money could go Anti-abortion groups run these bills all the time, and, and we're one of the states that pass them. And so they run these bills and, and, and run them at the flagpole, see how the courts react, and then kind of tweak them and then see what they can take to, to other a, red states. It's the same thing with the other two bills. One bans the sale of fetal tissue. Well, Planned Parenthood in Arizona doesn't. The other one says to state employees, you can give to any 501c3 or charity group through payroll deductions, but not if they do abortions. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, I want to skip ahead here and get to a county issue, the Diamondbacks and the, the Maricopa County. I mean, really going at it here. And, and Mike, you're, the, you're the, the sports business guy. Diamondbacks, county... It was an aging facility over there that was built yeah. back, in a, <laughs> back in the last century, right? Yeah. It's a century, century old facility at Chase Field. It, it's gone public. This has been out there for a while. It's 49,000 seats. It's a too big of a ballpark. And so uh, most of the ballparks built after that have been a lot smaller. And the Diamondbacks have been looking for ways to, to, to get around that. You know, it's how do, you, how do you reduce the number of seats? And they've been going back and forth with the county about how do we improve it, how do we modernize it. They see all these other uh, newer, spiffier, revenue-producing stadiums out there. And so this you, you, has gone you, public now with who's responsible for, what, $187 million worth of right. repairs or renovations. The Diamondbacks want the county to do it. The county wants the Diamondbacks to do Is it. Is this a ploy to get involved. We know the Suns and the Coyotes are both looking for something out there, and they're all wrangling around, and the Diamondbacks don't want to be left in the lurch. Sure. I mean, if you, if you ask voters to pay for something, and they've already paid for the hockey and the, ba the basketball stadium, I'm going to be too excited about the baseball. Well, are we going to see some, like, total, humongous sort of stadium well, district well, well, thing? I know that that's one of the angles, and I know the city of Phoenix and the mayor are probably drooling over themselves on this idea of, of having that. But I'll tell you, the voters, look, the county supervisors took a lot of guff. And a bullet. And a bullet, literally, for, for Mary Rose Wilcox over this whole issue of the, of the stadium. Now it turns out, you know, they did cut a, what, what they, the county probably thinks is a great deal. The Diamonds Act say, well, wait a sec, we have an aging scoreboard. It's not state of the art. And I don't think they recognize that how hostile mm -hmm. the public is. Wait, wait a sec, we paid for this thing? You like the thing, it was your design, now you want something smaller and more intimate? They want state of the art, Howie. State of the art, you mean like Wrigley Field? Oh, I'm sorry, bad Howie. Yeah, <laughs> state, but th that's it. State of the art is, oh, is the definition. It's revenue it's producers, and, and you're absolutely right about the other teams. The Coyotes are looking, people are talking about Karsten mm -hmm. Golf Course. 
you know, the Suns are looking and the Diamondbacks don't want to be left out. All right, we got to stop it right there. Good conversation. Good to have you here. Monday on Arizona Horizon, Department of Child Safety Director Greg McKay talks about the balance of protecting children and respecting parental rights and will update the performance of Arizona's bioscience industry. That's Monday on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.